Well, thanks for rolling with us, folks. Uh, we're going to speak to Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson, by the way, is going to be at our Power Talk 3 conference, June 17th, 18th at Union Temple Baptist Church. Starts uh, Friday at 4 o'clock with Professor Griff, uh, Professor Klingman, as you heard, Reverend Willie Wilson, Dr. Julius Garvey, Booker T. Coleman, or some of you know him as Kabe Kameni, Dr. Ava Muhammad, and also on Saturday with Dr. Patricia Newton, uh, Dr. Tony Browder, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Baba Dick Gregory, and Dr. Malefia Sante. Dr. Anderson is going to receive the Francis Cress Wilson Freedom Fighter Award at that event. So for more information, go to PowerTalkSeries.com or if you're in the DMV, just go over to Union Temple Baptist Church in Anacostia. That's 1225 W Street Southeast. That's between King and the Frederick Douglass Memorial. Dr. Anderson, welcome back to WOL Radio. Well, I'm glad to be back, Carl. How are you doing today? Doing great. I, I, I'm sorry you missed the spirited conversation we had with uh, Tuskegee Mayor Johnny Ford about the, the convention that they're holding. Because one, one of the things that the listeners uh, kept asking about the economics, you know, we, we need to talk about economics, where they were talking about what you would probably term as side issues. <laughs> well, Carl, you know, I've tried for 55 years to try to keep blacks focused as much as I could. And even though I, I, I support most of them because I, I know they're trying to, their best to, to elevate the quality of life for our people and their potential empowerment, and, uh, but the biggest difficulty is that they just can't seem to figure out the number one premise in politics and to use it to, for the economic development. The first thing is you should never, 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 never go into a political arena in a very, using very broad, basic concepts and terms and, and issues. You should never go into an economic marketplace in a very broad form. We call that shotgunning. Go in with a rifle point. And that's why I created what, what, my, what I call my... Well, five, give us an example. Huh? Give us an example. Well, like, for instance, you, five, my five-story building, you got all kinds of aspects of problems for black folk. Your key problem should be focused on what I wrote in my first book, and to call, I concentrated after rising in, in, to the best of my ability to the highest levels of everything in education, from teaching elementary school all the way through principalships to being over the state educational system for Florida for seven years, to going from the highest to the levels in education, for getting five or six university degrees, for going to the highest levels of politics, but not being, a, being in a campaign, but, but then being the campaign manager for presidents and for governors and attorney generals and mayors. And, uh, and state senators and congressional people running the campaigns, not being in the campaigns, to show them and take all of my expertise and say, now, how do I get, get, go about analyzing and all the skills I learned in the Marine Corps in safety and survival to teach black folk how to solve our historical structural dilemma? And it came out to be that you got it, got it, and I broke them up into two parts, and I put that in my first book called Black Labor, White Wealth. And I showed every, and I went through history. For 1,400 years, and showed every, showed every trick, every technique, every public policy, every law, every, uh, every trick that white folks would come up with to mal intentionally maldistribute almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, power, land, resource, privileges, businesses, and rights, and that controls all levels of government into the hands of the dominant white society and every succeeding immigrant group coming to America. That is our basic problem. That is your number one problem. That should be the first thing you should be focusing on, is the redistribution of wealth in the richest city, richest continent on the earth, which is the Americas, and the rich, richest nation in America, in the Americas, which is the United States. The total maldistribution of all the resources into the hands of the dumb and white society. The Constitution then locked you into a social construct that you're still locked into. The Constitution laid out exactly what you're going to be back in 1789. You're still locked into it because we've never addressed it, the issues that have locked us into the bottom, the lowest level of a real-life monopoly game. That's the first problem. We have never focused in my lifetime on trying to resolve the number one purpose of slavery. We never touched it. And the second thing is our inappropriate behavior patterns that we have consistently for 500 years always done things that were contravened, that was opposed to, resistant to, and, and to the development of our own people. We've always had an altruistic attitude that was imposed on us by the religious aspect, saying, take care of everybody else first. Hang yourself on the cross like Jesus Christ and put your, and as a slave, have no self-interest, no group interest. Have put everybody else's interest first. And we've always done things that have injurious to our own people. So consequently, we are not moving, Carl, because those two problems, I put all that in the book, Black Labor, White Wealth, 
with timelines, so there's no reason for black folk to be majoring in the minors, digging in the minutiae, messing with secondary spinoff issues rather than focusing on the number one problem. You do not own and control enough of anything in this nation to be a successful and competitive people. The same thing is true with Africa. You don't own and control enough of anything. America has about, 100, about, about $115, $120 trillion worth of economy and wealth in this country. We own one half of 1% of it. In Africa, where we make up, um, with Africa and America, we make, in the Caribbean, we make about 25% of the population of the world. And even in Africa, blacks own one half of 1% of the wealth. We own and control nothing. That's why people are beating the hell out of you. You're not playing the game to win. You want to practice socialism and all the other kind of ism and our ism and everybody else. So, that's it. so until we learn to play the game, we're never going to win. And right now I'm, in, I'm frustrated and I'm scared to death of my people because every time they have a meeting, every time they want to get together, they want to talk about all the issues. They don't want to go in with a rifle. And so our first thing is, attra- is attack those things that got us locked into the bottom of a social construct that we cannot get out and we don't have any wealth and power and resources. And one of the number one examples I told you last time I talked with you is land. This land is an example. This nation gave away one billion, B-I-L-L-I-O-N, one billion acres of free land in, in starting in the 1790s to immigrants come to this country under what they call the American dream. Now, here black folk got one half, less than one half of anything that controlled very little land. At one time, we had a 20 million acres of land in 1920. Now we're down to about 300,000 acres of land. You don't own and control anything from, from Boston to, to San Diego. And I'm trying to tell you right now, unless we started focusing, I want to see black folk focus on one issue at a time and thoroughly examine every aspect of it. All right, let me interrupt you and ask you this. What should be that first issue that we should focus on? First thing is economics. I told black folk and told black folk, and, not that I, that, and if they don't want to listen to me, fine. Because at my age, I don't care that much anymore. I, I've spent my life fighting for black folk. You focus, it's like a five-story building. The first thing you focus on is economics. You build your own community. You build your own community where you can store your values, your history, your orientation, your sense of protection, your wealth, your businesses, and your culture. And, your, and, build, and in the end, you build businesses where, that, that you can buy and support and, and, and put jobs and money on the table for your own people. And then you have to have, you have to have, yet we in this country, we don't have one, we have, don't have a single black community in America. All we got are black neighborhoods. And we should be building those black neighborhoods and rebuilding them. Instead of what social integration destroyed our communities, we gave up everything that was of value for to be socially integrated. Social integration was not the problem with slavery. No, but whites were very socially integrated. Black folk were working in white folks' houses, in the mansions. They were, they were waiting on the table. They were waiters, cooks, butlers. They were nurses and everything for white folk, cooks and doing everything they want. They've always been socially integrated. All the dirt cabins, slave cabins was out around the white, the white plantations. When social integration didn't solve anything, the thing is that we have never said, how do we recapture? That's what they, how do we recapture all the wealth and resources that we never got? And see, and we don't do it because you've got, you got a policy in this country called the American Dream. The American Dream was put in place called in 1790, which says, call in all people from around the world in a descending order of acceptability, Go, going in skin color degradation, going white, yellow, brown, black. And they can come in this country and they can get, and they can get, they can get, get free benefits get unearned benefits that are going to be produced by these slaves. And, they, and, and what I call, I call, call them, uh, 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 you know, just, 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 uh, just get the benefits. And we said we'll start with that based on, on skin color and grace and going down. And so every white person came to America and get all the land he wanted. As I told you before, George Washington, for instance, got 100,000 acres of free land. 100,000 acres of free land. Thomas Jefferson got over 100,000 acres of free land. Patrick Henry got 65,000 acres of free land. Every white person came to America as an immigrant because an immigrant was a freeloader. A freeloader. They didn't come here looking for no religious freedom and looking for, for, for hard work. They wanted hard work. They could have gone to work in Russia in the salt mines. They came here looking to get the benefits of having a free labor class. And Indian land, Indian land made up about, about 10% of the American dream, and black labor made up 90%. So every white person coming to America could get 650 acres of free land when he came to America. And for every slave they had, they, they'd get another 150 acres. We get the United States gave the American railroads, about 12 railroads, about 23 million acres of free land. And then in the last land rush in the 1860s to 1880s, they picked, up, they picked up over 2 million acres of free land European immigrants did in 24 hours. Now all that land that they got, using the land as an example, 
call to solve to answer your question. All that land they got that they now own 99 one half percent of all the land. Now on that that means that every all the timber, land, gold, silver, chrome, balsite, oil, material, everything on that land has been had multiplied and doubled and tripled in value every 20 years. Black folk own and control nothing in this country of value. Nobody respects you when you don't own and control a damn thing. So you're going to have these conferences. Quit talking about secondary issues. Like, well, we're going to, we've, got, we've got to solve the problem between black women and black men. That's not a problem. Because they, black women weren't even being brought into the country until after 1808. They didn't need black women in America. They were bringing in the biggest, strongest black man they, get, they could get and working them to death before he got to be 45 years of age. They didn't start bringing in black women until after 1808. And all of a sudden they found out they couldn't bring them in. They said, what we'll start doing is raising our own slaves. We'll use South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and we'll start using them to, 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 to sort of prostitute the women so they can produce free babies. We can get free children by, by having either white men or black men you know, impregnate the women. That, and so we don't, that, that's not an issue. Comparing a women's issue with a black issue, a racial issue, is like comparing a headache with cancer. <laughs> our people just can't concentrate and focus on the key thing. Right. So, 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 Doc, so, so, so break it down for us, though, because you say economics. You, and economics. you, talk, you talk about no. land. So should no. we be out acquiring land? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. See, see, once you build your community, you started spending your money. Once you build your community, you started practicing group economics. Why can't we understand that? Start to practicing group economics. That's just the opposite of what you were taught in the 1970s by the Civil Rights Movement, where all of a sudden we were taught to take find pleasure and leave well, it out. Hold that thought, Doc. We got to take a quick break. I'll let you talk about the group economics after that. 800-450-7876. You too can reach out to Dr. Claude Anderson. We call him the man with the plan. Get, hit us up. Again, it's 800-450-7876. Your call's next on 1450. WOL, where information is power. I'd like to stay with us, folks. Just want to remind you, uh, coming up later this week, Malik Zulu Shabazz is going to be here. Also, uh, uh, Darren Muhammad, researcher Darren Muhammad, is researching now the, if you, you may not, you may have missed it, the, uh, first police officer accused of, of killing Freddie Gray. The verdict came back. He was found not guilty. So, Brother Darren's all over that. And he'll be joining us tomorrow with an update. 800-450-7876. Speak to Dr. Anderson. Before we left for the break, Dr. Anderson, he was telling us that we should practice group e economics. Right. It, 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 right. Once you once you build your communities and build uh, or a broad sense of a community where you identify with your own people first and foremost, and you make a commitment to start practicing group economics, both either regionally uh, or internationally, whichever either way you can do it all together, and you and you start building and a, and, a, and a, in your community you must have three commit three elements to have a community. You must have a wholly independent economic structure. You must have a code of conduct that will teach you how to support from, buy from, and protect your own people first. And you must have a policy and with elected officials that you can hold accountable for being responsible for your needs first and foremost. And so you build an economy. And that economy tells you straight up front that, that, you, that you, buy, you buy from your own people first and you sell to everybody. And you, and you practice group economics by meaning your money must bounce in, on a, typically from 8 to 12 times before it leaves your community. Hispanic money, for instance, bounces 6 to 7 times. White money bounces 8 to 12 times. Asian and Arab money bounces uh, 12 to 13 times. Jewish money bounces 18 times. Black money doesn't bounce once because we're the only people who won't practice group economics. And therefore, that means for well, every $1 we? We, spend, we spend outside our team, we flush $11 down to there in toilet. toilet. So, so why don't we, Doc? Why don't, why don't we uh, practice group? What's stopping us? Because they've been conditioned. We're the only people that don't have none of our basic institutions like our churches, our, our families, and our civil rights organization, our political organization. They never, 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 never focus on the issues. They, want to, they always want to focus on the symptoms, the side effects of our condition. Well, Dr. Adams, what we've got to be concerned about is low-income housing and food stamps and welfare and finding more jobs and dysfunctional school and drugs and teenagers. Those are symptoms of your damn problem. If you go back and you start getting, building your own communities and have your own wealth and power bases, you can solve those problems. Because once you get started practicing, you're getting your money, collecting your money, making your money bounces eight to 12 times in your own community, you take that money and you go to the second floor. It's a five-story building. That's why I wrote the book Powernomics. That, and, and, uh, that book has been out there. Half the blacks don't read it even when they buy it. And the rest of them don't even care about reading it. That's why they go, never, they never. I'm not optimistic about black folks surviving in this country. The time has run out on them. The Power Numbers book says that, yes, racism has is, is, is got us locked and boxed into a social construct that was set up in the Constitution. It's being, it's being watched over by, by, the, by the United States Supreme Court. They, they have no authority to tell black folk how, what to do in race matters, but they've been doing it illegally. They're not authorized to do it. 
they keep you locked in boxes. You can't have any racial preferences. They don't have that authority. But anyway, once you get the money on the first floor in that five-story building, you take that money off the first floor and you go to the, go to the second floor. The second floor in the building is politics. You use your money to control all the politicians on, on the second floor. Any politicians, you buy them, buy it, B-U-Y. You buy every politician, just like the American Indians take their money out of the gambling casinos and buy all the politicians. You buy all the politicians. Any politician you can't buy on the second floor, like the Donald Trumps and the rest of these Rosenberg and the rest of these rich whites, you rent or you lease them. And, you, and if you have to buy black, buy black politicians too, then you take those politicians off the second floor and you, and you tell them, say, now that I've bought you, here's what you're going to do. You're going to start putting, impacting the police forces in this country and the courts and the jury system. You're going to tell the police, do stop shooting black folk for nothing, for, for, in, for minuscule, insignificant reasons. And tell the courts, you're going to quit giving black folk long terms. You make your politicians stop the courts and the police departments from abusing black folk. You can't do it now because you don't have the money to control the attorney generals and the politicians. They, they know that the only thing you're going to do is go out there and call your civil rights leaders and have a damn march. Then once you get the, get the court systems and under control and on, the, on the third floor, then you go to the fourth floor. You take your money off the first floor. you got to buy media. You've got to have media. Now, we've got about 12,000 radio stations in the United States. Blacks got about 70. We've got about, about 12,000 cable systems in the United States. Black folk don't own not one. 5,000 daily newspapers, we don't own one. 5,000, uh, uh, again, about 5,000 uh, TV stations, we don't own one of, in consequence. We can't, if you don't, if you can't have any communication systems, you cannot rebut the O'Reilly's and the Rush Limavalls and all these racist people on the Fox channel that keep saying black folk ain't worth this, black folk ain't worth a damn. Why? They make an issue out of you to make you look bad every day on the TV station. And they, and they get a bunch of black sambos and put them on the stations on both the NBC. They, some of them are called liberals. They go get them out of college and the university. They don't know a damn thing about race matters and put them on the TV and put them on the Fox channel to make black folk look ridiculous and look like criminal elements. But see, if you had money, you could punish those people. You can't punish them now because you don't have any money to punish the people to sell you out. And, but if you had your media, you can counter everything that the Fox Channel was doing. You can't do it now because you have no radio stations, you have no TV stations, you have no cable systems, you have no newspapers. Then once you get your money off the first floor, then you go to your last thing, you go to your school system. Quit worrying about schools at this point. The schools are not designed to educate black kids. I was over education for the state of Florida from 1970 to 1976. And that was everything from the first grade to the universities in both the public sector and the private sector. The schools were designed to set up to just maintain black kids. You, and the schools were never designed to make you competitive to white kids. You've got to have special curriculums that are designed in your school system. Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, the, still the school here. system must be designed to carry out the needs of the black children, what they need. Black children need industrialization and community and, and, and business development. They need to be taught commerce. We got all these black, instead of teaching them all to be athletes and playing and running and singing and dancing, you should be teaching them, no, don't worry about playing basketball and football. Teach them how to go out and manufacture footballs and baseballs and tennis balls and baseball bats and gloves. Tell them how to learn how to control the, 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 the sports industry and how to build and own the stadiums, how to do all the promotions for it and, and learn how to set up athletic unions where you can control the, 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 the players and their salaries and all these systems. Same thing in music. You should be owning and controlling everything in music from the bottom to the top because everybody in this country and around the world dance and sing off of black music. It's your music. And same thing in sports. But we're not practicing economics. That's why we don't have anything. And tell the kids in the schools, no more basketball and football. You're going to have to learn how to now how to write business plan, do inventory control, how to learn when you graduate from the, from the elementary school how to invent something. Good. And when you get to high school, how you must take two years of, of mechanical trainings where you have a trade, and our philosophy should be never let a black kid graduate from high school unless he have a skill in his hand or a scheme in his head to be able to survive and compete with his people. But see, when they quit sending so many damn black kids off to college, get a college education, and get master's degrees and coming back and working at Burger King's and McDonald's because they haven't got any businesses in their own neighborhood, and whites are not going to hire them. They don't want blacks, blacks hired in key positions in all those stores. And so you got to, and that's what you got all these kids with master's degrees, they don't master a darn thing. So then to the so, so develop your education system, the first to, to take care of your needs. And I told, told some teachers down in Tampa, Florida, uh, way back in 1975. And the teacher said, well, Dr. Elson, we treat all of our kids the same. I said, you need to be fired. Black kids come to school with different emotional, financial, physical, and political baggage than white kids do. 
You got to have your curriculum modified, adjusted to take care of the needs of black children. Doc, let me ask you this, because you says it can, that the clocks run out on us as a group. But individually, if we follow poweronomics, can we can we survive this thing individually? You know, it, it, yeah, they are, yeah. In certain, if you're in the safe areas, you can. But you, they get you last. All they're gonna do is hold you for last. If not, the safe areas in America for black folk were set up during slavery. Every Saturday night around the plantation, and they used to call it burning off the energy from black folk. They knew that black folk were frustrated and tired and hopeless at the end of every week. So on Saturday night, they'd let them come around and come out in front of the mansion in this plantation house. And they would give them, give them glasses of lemonade and iced tea and let black folk sing hymns or play on the banjo or beat on drums and tum-tums or beat on the banjos. Or they could have and, 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 and just do the, what they call the jig and do the dancing. And then, and, and, uh, or they also put them in sports where they can either have horseshoe pitching at night, uh, wrestling contests and the head butting contests and coon hunts to burn off their energy so by the come Monday they'd be ready to go back to work again in the fields picking cotton. And so that was a safe area. They say any time a black person engaging in any form of entertainment, he is safe to white folk. We know he's going to be non-threatening. So in our society, black, black entertainers will be the last ones to go down. They'll be, they'll, be, they'll be blessed by the white society because white folks love to control the industries that they're running. White folks are going to own all the stadiums and the football stadiums, the basketball stadiums and teams and everything. But anyway, they'll be safe. And the same, that's not unusual, Carl. That's exactly what the Germans did to the Jews in World War II. In about 1938, they went in and started rounding up all the Jews to be under the Holocaust, to be exterminated. And, those, and, and, and they set up the, up the concentration camps where they're going to gas them and burn them and, what they, and shoot them. And what they did, they took all the Jewish entertainers and they would bring them to the camps. They put them into a special category. And, so they, and during the day, they played music and beat on the bands and made music and sounds so that, that, that those who were being gassed, the Jews who were being cooked alive or gassed, you couldn't hear their, their cries and scream as they were being cooked because the music and the dance and they, everybody was busy watching the entertainers. Well, that's the same thing going to happen in this country. Right now, you go in right now, cut on your TV today. Almost every safe black is going to be doing either playing with, with a foot, be chasing some kind of a ball, football, basketball, tennis ball, golf ball, singing and dancing and telling jokes and pretending he's having a ball that black folk don't have a problem, and, that, and they're going to be the last ones to go, and they know that. They got the money. But in most of those cases, most of the whites are controlling their money, and when they, when they get ready to get those blacks, they're going to take that money from them before they put them down, along with their, all the rest of their black people. Now, are those the same ones who have made it to middle class and upper middle class, and, and those are the ones that they point to and say, hey, they've made it. If, if Oprah can make it, you can make it. If Quincy Jones can make it, or, uh, or Michael Jordan can make it, you too can make it. What's stopping you? That's, that's the, what they usually say. Even some, some uh, conservative blacks feel that way. Well, I just explained it to you, and I use the German, the German Jews as an example. Because, you see, you always, Carl, always remember this. You always are going to have exceptions. I can toss a coin up and up straight up in the air and, and flip a coin. It can land on, t on tail a thousand times in a row, but sooner or later it's going to land on head. So, it, so there are always exceptions to the rules. That's the first thing. That's why you have the Oprahs and the, and the, and the football players, the basketball players that may be making $100, $100 million a year. Those are exceptions. The second thing is that you always got some white person or organization in the society that, is, that it will make an, a, to pick and choose a specific black person. And call him to call him out and say, "This is my special black," just like you did in 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 the old movies. You know, they would always pull one black to their breast and hold his head. So he's a different kind of black. He's different from all the other blacks. Uh, we might we might shoot and lynch the other blacks, but this one he's special. This is my boy. We're gonna make him an exception, and they'll hug and and let him get by. And the last point is when you have black folk to get by and do extremely well, is that white racism is not perfect. It's not perfect. You're always going to, that, that's, that's what we better say. White, no, white racism is not perfect, particularly if you're competing against it, one of the Powernomics principles. You start reading that book, Powernomics, and go from chapter one through eight, you learn how to compete and learn how to win and play the game. So, and so as a matter of fact, even doing slavery, we had, we had about four and a half, almost five million black folk enslaved. We had about 387,000 that were free. But out of that eight, 387,000 blacks that were free doing slavery, about 6,000 were doing extremely well. They were doing very well. They, they, in today's terms, they could be classified as millionaires because, they, because even some of them own slaves. You're always going to have exceptions, but don't let people trick you into saying, well, because you, there's an exception, uh, all blacks could be just like you. All the things I've done in my life, I don't expect other blacks to be as successful as I was in doing it. 
they, 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 don't, they didn't have what I came into the earth with. They didn't have the opportunities I had. And see, and that's why black folk can't make it. The last thing that the black person should be looking for, and if you hear people use it, you stop them, is start talking about equality and equal opportunity. In a race-based society, racism means competition. Uh, uh, people are competing to survive. You cannot. The worst thing you can do is go out and have meetings and forums and to try to figure, talk about equal opportunity. The whole point of racism is to, not to create equality, it's to create inequality. Right. Hold that thought right there, Doc, because we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk, you know, she tells us about it, the, the piece in the African magazine that they did on you. 800 450 7876. Folks want to speak to Dr. Anderson, calls on next on 1450. WOL, where information is power. Thanks for rolling with us and our guest, the man with the plan, Dr. Claude Anderson. I'm going to call to speak to Dr. Anderson. Put in a question for him so he can respond, folks. 800-450-7876. I know I promised I was going to ask you about Africa, but I'm going to ask you this question, Doc, before I take some calls. Mm -hmm. 1970, blacks were displaced by fabricated minorities. What happened in 1970? Well, in 1970, in response to, uh, to two things, one is that uh, that President Nixon uh, won the election for the President of the United States. And uh, at that point in time, we had the Civil Rights Movement in total bloom, and also the Black Power Movement was blooming. And so and, uh, 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 Senator Monaghan uh, told Nixon, said, the best way you can shut down the Black Civil Rights Movement in this country and the Black, and the black Power Movement is to take the focus off of black folk and shift it to minority women and immigrants. And said that you can shut them down. And so, and so in 1970, that's what they did. So I wrote the first affirmative action plan in the, in the United States since the Constitution. And see, most people don't know. Right now, i got people meeting across the country, and they still don't know that the first affirmative action plan in the entire United States was the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution is an affirmative action plan for whites to make sure they get everything they want in preference to you. So I wrote their first, second affirmative action plan in 1971. I wrote it for the state of Florida. That was approved by the governor and the state cabinet system. And I put that, wrote that affirmative action plan for black people. I did not write the affirmative action plan for any minorities, women, gays, transsexuals, uh, uh, people with ingrown toenails or handicapped, or midgets or humpbacks or lesbians. I wrote it for black folk. And so when, when, Mon when, when Nixon got the Man Man uh, Monaghan memo in 1970, uh, they then shifted and said, what we'll do then, to, uh, we'll take the folks off of black folk and we'll shift it to these groups. And they made that shift. That was the first time in the history of this nation that Hispanics were now classified now as not as being whites but as minorities. They never in the history of the nation had Hispanics been classified as whites because Hispanics are nothing but white folks speaking Spanish. And so on, so on the 1970 census, they did switch it and put Hispanics up there now to be classified so they now can compete for the, for the, for the resources that should have been going to black folk. And that, and, that, and that stifled the movement for black folk. That's the same thing that occurred throughout history. And then at the end of 1965, they did the same, 66, they did the same thing with the civil rights law. When I, when after, as we talked about trying to get, some, get some, uh, some benefits for black folk, you had a congressman from Virginia and a, and a senator from Louisiana that says in no way are we going to let black folk get something in this country ahead of white women. And so they stuck into the civil rights law, Title IX, which means include women into everything so they can get benefits ahead of black folk. And so when I became, got over education, I did, a, I did an analysis and, and called, contacted all six or seven counties in Florida, educational counties, school systems, and asked them, say, out of desegregation funds, how are you going to spend these monies? Uh, it's supposed to be spent for black folk. And every county, superintendent sent a letter back saying they're going to spend their money on, on women, not on black folk. And that took us right back to, to 100 years before that when they started writing, when blacks came out of slavery in 1866, and seeing the white feminist movement had gone into full effect, saying you cannot give rights to black folk in the 1865 civil rights law, the 1866 civil rights law, without, without and exclude white women. They went to court, to the Supreme Court, and filed a lawsuit that blocked black folk from getting the civil rights laws. That's one of the things that killed the, the, the 1865, the 1866 civil rights law, was white women going and filing, saying blacks are not going to get ahead of women. And then it is, but the Supreme Court ruled saying, no, that's not, that's not right, it's not fair, because you women are in a protected class. White women are in a protected class. And then, then they put the Indians, put Indians into a protected class. And black folk would demand to be put into protected class by a few civil rights, I mean, uh, radical Republicans. And they started what's called the Freedmen Bureau. They put blacks in there. 
and they put blacks in there, and, and, and after two years, all the benefits that should have gone to black folk were split up when they, and added white, white women, poor whites, and white plantations on it, so all the land and benefits that blacks could have, shouldn't have gotten out of the Freedmen Bureau went back to whites too. So all through history, every time black folk had an opportunity to gain some benefits, to readdress that first problem I told you is the maldistribution of resources in this country. Blacks do not own a sufficient amount of, amount of anything or control a sufficient amount of anything to be able to survive and live in this country very much longer. You're going to perish. You're going to die. And if you don't learn how to play the game and the power economics books, black labor, white wealth tells you how to play the game. And black folk can keep doing what they're doing, think that somehow they're going to make it. And I'm telling you, they're in a world of trouble if they don't start practicing those principles and learn how to focus on starting at the bottom of that, of that five-story building. Focus on economics. We got a lot of black, uh, smart black people across this country with master's degrees, doctor's degrees, lawyers, and engineers. Start to focus on how we gain, gain more resource ownership in this country. And don't be like the South Africans. They want me to go to South Africa, as you mentioned a few minutes ago. They want me to come to South Africa because the South Africans got bamboozled. They went up there and, and, and instituted a constitution in South Africa that stipulated that there that, that could, that could be no preferential treatment for African blacks. Now, why would you put up in to put in something that you get? That here you are as Africans haven't got a darn thing in. You got you got you got you got 29 and a half million whites, and only two. I mean, 29 million blacks in South Africa, and two million whites. And you go put in a special stipulation to a constitution saying you can't help your own people. And then at the same time, then you pass put in a, uh, an affirmative action program for Chinese coming into South Africa to give put them into a special program called affirmative action for Chinese coming into to South Africa to take over the resources. I just can't believe this. I want black folk to get together and show me, and I'll come to their meetings. Other than that, I'm not going to any more of these meetings. If you can't focus on your own people to learn how to practice group economics and group empowerment, I don't want to come. All right, 800-450-7876. Get your questions ready for Dr. Anderson. Let's go to line one. Jay's calling it from New York. Jay, your question for Dr. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson, all I could say to begin with is you are on fire. You are speaking the truth. I lived in Harlem for over 50 years, and now we're at the point to where as black people don't even own 5% 5% of Harlem may not even own one or two grocery stores if they own that. Only thing black folks own is the church, the barber shop, and maybe a beauty saloon. I'm starting to believe you, brother. It's over for us. We have no direction on where we're going collectively as a people. We can't come together to do anything. We can't even get these pork chop chicken eating institutions to put their money in black banks or create a black bank. Brother Anderson, it's over for us. My only question to you would be, how can we, other than what you have already said, salvage ourselves to the point like we could just live, be here for another 50 or 60 years, because if we decide to go the direction of the guy who was on before you, we're even more lost than I ever thought we was. All right, well, thanks, well, Jay. Dr. Anderson? Yeah, well, well, let me tell you, the easiest thing to do, and I don't want to put down anybody else, because I didn't hear anybody else on the air, because I know we got a lot of smart, good, good blacks out there that are trying their best to come up with some ideas, and see, I just differ them on the, on the approach uh, and, and the, on the focus and the priority that they're taking. I want to prioritize blackness. See, I'm not, in, I'm not into minorities and both people of color and diversity and gender and trans. I'm only, only our ism I'm into is our ism and blackism. And so I don't want to put anybody else down. But now, you, but you ask me, what can we do? The first thing I would say I would, is go out and buy those books, Black Labor, White Wealth, and Powernomics, and the Dirty Little Secrets book. Black Labor, White Wealth lays out the nature of your problem, how you got into it and how, every technique that was used to put you into it and lock and box you. Power numbers show you how to break out of it and get out of it. And the other two books are called Dirty Little Secrets 1 and Dirty Little Secrets 2, which tells you that you are very special people. Black people are exceptional people. There's nobody on this earth like black Americans. You are different from anybody. And exceptionalism means those who have been treated differently. No groups in this country have been treated like black folk. You're the only people who are denied everything, a right to your fruits of your labor, to food, to clothing, to education, to right to vote, to participate in government. 
Nobody. They have never divided. They didn't, the Asians come to this country. Nobody has, has enslaved them. They didn't enslave and deny Asians anything or Arabs anything or, or women anything or gays or, or transsexuals. But you got every level of government from the highest to the lowest going around trying to look out for those groups instead of looking out for black folk. And first and foremost, that's unconstitutional. That is in violation of the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment. It's in violation of the civil rights laws. Those civil rights laws mandated in 1860 that black folk be treated in all manners as like whites and that every level of government use every necessary means to lift the burdens and legacies off the shoulders of black folk. They were designed, those laws were designed to, 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 to reverse the Dred Scott decision of 1857 that says a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. The Dred Scott decision had nothing to do with gender and transgenders and gays, nothing to do with them. It had to do with, it says that a black man has no rights, not an Asian man, an Arab man, anybody with ingrown toenails. It says a black man. And those laws are put into the books specifically and solely for black folk. folk. And yet now, so when you have your conventions, I would like to see black folk going and, and analyzing every aspect of the Constitution and sort of figuring out how to play these games and win. And they're based on black folks' exceptionality. And the first thing I would say to you to do, go back and start questioning and raising Cain about all these constitutional rulings from the Supreme Court, saying that you can't give preferences to black folk, when at the same time that's what the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment said. It said, and it said that black folk ought to be treated in an exceptional manner. That's what the civil rights laws are saying. And so there are a lot of, to start talking about why black folk right now are not, being, not getting an immigrant, all these immigrant funds. Because, see, everybody coming to America can get benefits except black folk. Black people are the only non-immigrant in America. You need to stop your elected officials from talking about, well, we're an immigrant nation. When they know, know we're not an immigrant nation, everybody here might be an immigrant except black folk. Black folk are the only non-immigrants here. And they're right. talking about we got immigrant rights. All right. Hold that thought right there, Doc. We've got to take a quick break. I look at the traffic and weather. Actually, our last look at for the DMV. 800-450-7876. If you have a question for Dr. Anderson, that's the number to call to reach him. We'll take your calls next on 1450. W-O-L, where information is power. And thanks for staying with us, folks. So we, we have Dr. Claude Anderson. We call him the man with the plan. He's the only one who's got a plan for black America, specifically for blacks. And, again, he'll tell you he's not racist. He's just looking out for black America. If you're down with Dr. Anderson, you need to read his books, Black Labor, White Wealth. That's a best-selling book. Tells us how we got into the situation that we got or that we're in. It's not by our, our own fault. <laughs> you know, It's not by accident either. It was designed that way. And his second book, Powernomics, tells us how to get out of the situations where we're in and we're in and we're in it all across this planet as black people 800-450-7876 latoya's calling us from online too from dc latoya hey, you have a question Carl, for dr anderson can I, him, Carl, can I tell him how to fight how to get those books and things sure hang on a second latoya go ahead doc uh yeah t tell them to call if they, if they want to order them uh the quickest way is that you, they can go to the uh to their uh, website and go to uh www.powernomics.com and they can order them off of there off the website and once they order, we can get them delivered within 24 hours or 48 hours to them, straight to them. Or if they want to do that, they can also go to, uh, they can call our main office in, in uh, Washington, D.C. at 301-564-6075. Again, 301-564-6075. They can order from the Power Numics Corporation. And right now we're running a special. We've been running for about a year now called, uh, where we sell all four books. In a power pack, they can get Black Labor, White Wealth, Powernomics, and, and the Dirty Little Secrets book that shows them in all ways that nothing has happened on this earth that black folk were not indirectly or directly caused to, be, to happen. And those books tell you why you should be consider yourself to be exceptional people, and they can get all those books there, or they can always go to the black bookstores, or sometimes you can find them at the, at the, uh, the Barnes & Noble stores. And call from that out. I'll also, you asked me for some points, but things they should do, and I'm going to give you those when you're ready for it, okay? All right. I tell you what, let's take Latoya first, and then we can give us the points, because I think that's what, uh, uh, our caller from New York, New York wanted, Jay, wanted to find out, you know, what can we do? Do we accept it? But anyway, let's go to Latoya. She's been holding for a while. Latoya, your question for Dr. Anderson. Yes, and I'll definitely try to make it quick. Um, thanks for taking my call. And um, Dr. Claude, actually, you and I have connected before. Um, uh, my fiance and I had talked to you and your wife. So I'm not sure if you uh, remember my name. Um, so, um, I was trying to actually get um, Carl to connect us, but we finally did connect a month ago. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I'm good to hear from you again then. 
And so my my question is mainly because um, I know I had a brief conversation also with your wife too, and um, I think you guys have someone doing your social media. So my um, question is just making sure that that it's running smoothly. And then, like I said, my fiance and I are you know would offer to even help just to make sure that that that's being monetized. That's it, 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 was that was that the springboard? I'm sorry. Was it the, what was the name of your your plan? Was it the springboard or something like that? Um, no, it was um, it was like social media around like um, around like natural hair. Oh, okay. But well, well, see, sometimes we don't get back with this because we don't have that larger staff, and we just love all black folk and try our best, but we just don't have enough money. Yeah, she did. She did. She did reach back out to me, but I okay. Just, um, and she did provide. Um, I, uh, but I'm not sure if they got a chance to connect, and I just want to be able to. And like I said, I'm uh, this this service we would offer offer to you guys free because we just want to make sure that you're monetizing and, and maximizing because we know you've done a lot of work for us, and we just want to offer that service to you or at least connect with your um, person that's doing it for you now to make sure it's being maximized on YouTube, wherever you have your information. We just want to make sure it gets out there and that you get compensated for it. Well, well thank you. Do me a favor. Would, would you do it? Would you send it to us again? Because Okay, I can resend it. And, 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 and I love you all for it, you and your husband both. I just, I just love black folk. That's my weakness all of my life. I just, I just <laughs> love black folk. <laughs> even, though, even though half of them sometimes ain't worth a quarter, I still love the other half. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. But like I said, um, I'll, I'll step off and listen so I can get your point. But um, we're we're out here doing the work, uh, especially in natural hair. We run into some snags, but we're gonna keep on going. We're gonna keep doing this. And, and that's what, that's what I want. Going. That's what I want you to do. Keep doing it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Latoya. Thank uh, Doc, those pointers so that you said you were going to give us it because uh, we we know you, you've uh, you've highlighted the problems and we, and we figured out what the problems are. But we need some help getting out of the, out of this ditch. Yeah, well, see, and if you focus on the things I told you, you only got two major problems that you need to focus first and foremost on, and that's on the maldistribution, the historical maldistribution of resources into the hands of the dominant white society and all uh, immigrants coming into this country. And see, that's why, that's why, let's see, since 1970, you had, you've had the 90% of all the immigrants in this uh, Hispanic country been here less than 35 years. They came here and got in all the advantages that you should have been getting for the last 400 years. And all the jobs you got, that you got whipped, beaten, and shot, and hung over trying to get jobs in the federal government, they can walk into any public entity and get jobs because they're basically whites. And I'm not against them. I'm just saying that's, that's the way the system is structured. But if you're going to have sort of having all these conventions and meetings that all these blacks are planning, they need to focus strictly and first and foremost, they just strictly on, on the economics on how, and, all the, and all the institutions that are in place that got black folk locked in box, starting with the United States Constitution. Start with that affirmative action plan. That is that, and all in going to the immigration laws that this country has been instituting now for all these centuries. Uh, public policies have been bestowing everything into the hands of immigrants coming to the country, and black folk couldn't get couldn't get one free acre of land, but they've given one billion acres of free land to immigrants coming into the country. And like Obama, Obama has been giving almost every Hispanic group coming into the country. He rushes down and come up with immigrant programs. Last one coming up with 110,000 Hispanics on the border, children. He goes puts up three point eight billion dollars to give by them clothes, food and housing and transportation and education. And I said, Why didn't that money go into these urban cities? I got black kids in Chicago, Gary, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, that that and they're just barely holding on by a damn thread and and and, and in a rag that smoke run down house with the vacant lots and, and, and boarded up buildings. He's running out giving the money to people coming into the country as immigrants and now has plans to bring another hundred thousand uh Iraqis into the country. And see, that is un illegal and unconstitutional. So what I suggest you do is about four, see some of the things I've suggested black folk and all these conventions should focus on, and these things only. Stay away from all this gay, this transgenders and subgenders and hisgenders and all that stuff, and start to focus on the essence of those people who've been historically shut out of the system and they've never, been, and never had a, a, an opportunity to acquire a competitive group of, of resources. You can, black folk cannot compete now in a society talking about equality. I told you that before. There is, no, there is no equality unless you have equal control of the resources and the, and, the, and the power and the wealth. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. So the first thing you do then is start, start renegotiating your relationship with all these all businesses in this country. And, start, and start, once you start building your businesses, start telling these other businesses that you're going to start boycotting and start and, and hold, withholding uh, 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 consumer support of their market when they don't buy it. They don't buy on the black radio station. They don't buy from black folk. They don't put in the money in the black community. You started boycotting them like they boycott you. 
See, you don't see any white folks running into a black neighborhood buying anything from black folk. They don't do that. They've been boycotting black neighborhoods ever since the Civil Rights Movement. And that's why you don't see any Hispanics and Arabs and anybody else buying from black folk. And so they're, they're sucking the money out of your community, and, then, and they're not putting anything into it. Renegotiate your relationship with businesses. All those businesses you see that, that, that support Rush Limbaugh and, and O'Reilly and all these guys on, and, on, and Hannity that say all these negative bad things about them, you started sending letters to them and saying, look, you, you keep those guys on there to running down the black community and trying to, trying to, to, to criminalize black folk using the media that they have because they own and control it, then we're going to start boycotting their damn products. The second thing, go to your, all, your, all your damn political uh, uh, entities. You've got the Democratic and Republican Party. Now they've been running candidates for two years, and I have not heard not one single solitary political party nor a political candidate say anything positive about black folk, what they're going to do specifically and solely for black folk. They're talking about what they're going to do for gays and Arabs and Hispanics and Indians and, 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 and transsexuals. Not one has mentioned anything for black folk. And the great irony of all is that out of 44 presidents of the United States, never in the history of this nation has any candidate run for the president of the United States and made a commitment and promise and deliver something to black folk in this country. Nobody has ever, has ever promised and delivered anything to black folk specifically. They do it for all the other groups, but they won't do it for black folks. So you start telling them, tell them in the future that from now on, we're not going to support any political party or any political candidate who will not promise and deliver things to black folk. You need to start a meeting with the Democratic Party tomorrow and start sitting down with them saying, I don't care whether it's, Sand whether, whether it's going to be Sanders or it's going to be Hillary or it's going to be Trump. And so you're never going to get into black votes anymore until you start putting something on the table strictly for black folk. And we're not going to go for that old trick about saying we're going to put it into a broad category called minorities and poor folk and people of color and diversity and multicultural. That's a game plan that you run to try to move things away from black folk. So no, you be very specific. This is what we're going to deliver to the black community in terms of economic empowerment, money, and resources, specifically and solely for black folk. And don't give a damn about what the Supreme Court says. The Supreme Court does not have authority to overrule the 13th and 14th Amendment, no civil rights laws that say what you can't. They're supposed to be very specific. Those laws say you must be specific and lift the burdens of slavery off the backs of black folk, not of minorities and poor folk, not of gays and Arabs and Hispanics, not of transsexuals, and not of those that say it with ingrown toenails. You do it for black folk. And then you start renegotiate re your relationship with your own political candidates and say we will not support any candidate that won't deliver to us, including blacks. Any black that won't promise to do living anything to black, but don't vote for them. And then, then, then fourthly, what you do, you start working towards getting your own political party. Get you set up a black political party in America and don't run any candidates. Don't run any candidates. And we're not running any candidates. But what we're going to do, we're going to vote. We're going to start a black independent party and we're going to vote as a block. And we're going to vote as a block, 43 million strong. We are delivering. All right, hold million. that thought there, Doc. I'll let you finish on the other side. We've got a bunch of folks who want to speak to you. 800 450 7876 to speak to Dr. Anderson. Your call's next on 1450. WOL, where information is power. Well, thanks for rolling with us, folks, and our guest, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson. Dr. Anderson is going to be part of the Power Talk 3 conference Friday, June the 17th, and Saturday, June the 18th at Union Temple Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Friday, we start at 4 o'clock with the likes of Professor Griff, Dr. Jim Clement, Dr. Willie Wilson, Dr. Julius Garvey, Dr. Booker T. Coleman, or Kame Kameni. Some of you know him from the Hidden Colors series. He's been in all the Hidden Colors series. Dr. Ava Muhammad, she's the legal mind for the Nation of Islam. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Patricia Newton, Dr. Tony Browder, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Baba Dick Gregory, Dr. Malefi Asante. And it all starts again, as I mentioned, June 17th at Union Temple Baptist Church and June 18th. It's the third year doing it. It's been sold out all the time. So we want you to get your tickets now. Go over to PowerTalkSeries.com. If you're in the DMV, just go over to the church at 1225 W. Street that's southeast, that's between King and the Frederick Douglass Memorial in Anacostia. 800-450-7876. Doc, will you finish or do you want to take another call? No, no, let me finish. Give me a few more of these items I want them to do. As I said, I want them to start the end of Black Independent Party and vote as a solid block, 43 million strong across this country, and tell and advertise, tell everybody in the country, all the political candidates and other political parties, that you will vote for and support for any candidate, I don't, regardless of color, pink, yellow, polka dot, or whatever color he is, whoever promises the most and delivers the most to black people, that's who you're going to vote for. And don't let, don't be misled by all these bamboozling civil rights leaders tell you, well, you know, you, 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 you got to go out and register and vote because that's a right. 
uh, and uh, and you go in there for to to, to express yourself for for exercise. Well, let me life. interrupt you, Doc. What what? Because the last call it says uh, we got to vote because uh, people died for us to vote to have. Uh, that's, to that's a bunch. That's a bunch of tales. They nobody died to give up their life and no the right to vote. They might have had their life taken for them. But to Carl, politics is a simple process that decides who's going to get what benefits out of life. That's what politics is. It's based on a simple premise of quid pro quo. Something for something. One hand washes the other. You scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. If you put me in office, I'll give you benefits. You get something. Black folk got to quit letting people lie to them, bam, booze, and you go out there to exercise. It's, uh, voting is not about exercising a right. If you want to exercise, go to the gym or go jog around the park. Get yourself a membership in the gym. And if you're talking about uh, if you, uh, somebody died for that, they died because they were trying to get some resources. And so you vote as a block and tell, and tell, and tell everybody that if you vote for us, we'll give you what you need, but you give us what we, what we need too. And uh, and last thing to worry, don't be worried about. Well, Dr. Anderson, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party wants us divided. That's where we get our greatest strength. That's a lie. Do not let people bamboozle you into dividing yourself up between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. They've divided and conquered you again. Stay together as a block and vote as a block. Don't spread yourself between the Democrats and the Republican Party and vote as a block, and you can win. And that's what we should be doing. And people say, well, Dr. Anderson, uh, uh, the, the party needs my vote. Nobody needs your votes. This system is set up to where black folk have always, since, 18, since about 1750, to where we've been a permanent minority in this society based on the immigration laws. That's another thing that black folk must attack in this nation's immigration laws. And, then we've been, and that's why we, are, we, got, we were up to 40% of the population in, in 1750. Now we're down to 12%. Black folk must understand that the white people in this society do not need your vote. They don't need your vote because you're outnumbered nine to one. You were outnumbered eight to one up until the year 2000. Now Hispanics are coming to this country and push you back to nine to one. You're no longer second-class citizens. You're third-class citizens. White society does not need the black vote. And so, what you, and, uh, so consequently, you, if, you, if you do it mathematically, nine will go over one nine times with nothing left over. Whites don't need They can vote anybody into office anytime they want it without the black vote unless you use it as a block to get some power and wealth for yourself, starting economic power. All right. 800-450-7876. Brother X has joined us from Chicago. He's on line four. Brother X, you have a question for Dr. Anderson. Well, not really, because I hear Dr. Anderson all the time. But I would just appreciate to make a comment. The great Marcus Garvey said the white man will not, to any serious degree, integrate the Negro into his system. Because in doing so, the white man will be committing racial genocide, which he is not. I'll tell you what, Brother X, call do. on Friday and make your comments because people okay. want to get some understanding. I'll thank you for your call, though. Just call and make a comment. Just call on Friday. That's when we have open phones. But when we have a guest, ask him a question. Because if you feel you know everything, then you should be the guest. 800-450-7876. Abdul's calling us from California on line five. Abdul, your question for Dr. Anderson. Yeah, Carl, thank you for, for allowing me to call. How you doing, Dr. Anderson? Fine. How you doing today, buddy? Yes, yes sir. I, want, I wanted to make one comment first, and the comment was is that I bought a program for my, for my grandchildren called Future Black Millionaires, and you know what I mean? And I think that it's probably one of the most excellent programs around. Secondly, you know what I mean? Yesterday, this morning, I saw a brother outside of the store right here on Manchester and Western, and he was begging for quarters. And I told him, I said, brother, you got to get up and do something. Because we have turned into punks, real punks in America. And I think that what Dr. Anderson is saying is the most significant piece. I ain't worried about no politics. You know what I mean? My whole goal right now is to build wealth for my children. You know what I'm That's going to come after me. And I ain't leaving it to no crazy children. Because if they ain't got the same agenda I got, then I'll leave it to my grandbabies. My question is this, is I give $5 a month to your program. That's about all I can afford right now. You know what I mean? Well, we appreciate that. Friends. I'm real good friends with Dr. Milligan. So, I mean, I've been to, you know, all your, man, I got all your books. I read yours, Dr. Boy. I've read everybody's books. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to implement this policy every day by talking to young African-American males and females, gang members, non-gang, I don't care what they are. I'm going to have a conversation with them about building wealth, about consolidating their wealth, because that's the most important thing to me. My question is, is are we going to have some kind of movement, you understand, what I'm saying, where we come together collectively and do something? You know what I mean? Because there's going to be a lot of Negroes that ain't going to make it. 
You know what I mean? Because that's what they want to be called as Negro. I'm talking about conscious people, conscious black people, like the one million conscious black voters and et cetera. Anyway, that's my question. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Anderson, and thank you, Carl, for allowing me to speak. And, and thank you for all your support, both financially and for your spiritual support. And, uh, but you're absolutely right. If blacks got to come together very quickly, otherwise they, they're through in this country. You are now a, an official permanent underclass as of 2013. And what we have to do then is to help people like yourself that are trying to figure out how to establish a monetary base where they can own and control resources and don't have to go around and beg somebody to go into their hotel, their restaurants, or go into their, into their movie theaters. What you have to do is you've got to start jumping on these politicians. I would start at the White House and go down. Now, now we've got, we got a black man in the White House. He's been putting out all kinds of money and programs for all kinds of groups around this country and trying to get them into a protected class. Black folk need to say, we want black people in America to be put into a pr protected class just as they were in 1866 in the Freedmen Bureau. They put women into a protected class. They put the Indians into a protected class. That's why you got the Federal Indian Bureau, where every Indian gets something like twenty three dollars to $24,000 every year for every Indian. And they get benefits all the time. And since Obama's been in office, for instance, every, every Christmas he's given $3.5 billion every year to Indians. Uh, and, these, and these are the Indians are the descendants of, of the, of the slaveholding Indians that enslaved black folk. So while the slave, the slave holding Indians, the descendants of slave holding Indians are getting benefits, they are violating the 1866 Indian Treaty where those benefits should have been going to black Indians and black freemen. And so you need to start putting pressure on every politician from the White House down and says, we want you to go to every major city where you got black folk or the majority population and, and, and cut up districts there. And so I set up development, regional development banks there. And so I put money into those and revolving loans for those little black folks. They can start money. They can find low interest money to start building businesses. And black folks can start buying from their own people across this nation and into third world countries like the Caribbean and Africa. And buying from each other, supporting each other, and employing each other. And that, that's what they should start and demand that they set up special programs and, and, and have the president appoint a czar to be over black economic development in this country, right next door to the president. And, at, and demand that each one of these politicians, before you vote in November, you damn sure better get out there and demand and, and hit the papers. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're, we're listening. Okay, Go ahead. Okay, hit the, hit the papers and demand that, 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 that the newspapers print it and the television radio stations print it, that black folk in this country are sick and tired of being sick and tired, that they want, to start, they want these candidates and these political parties to start saying, here's what we're going to do for black folk, not midgets, not gays, and not lesbians. Those people, nobody's ever done anything to them. Those laws were put on the books for black folk. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and 1866 and 1865 civil rights laws were for black folk. But they let other people take it away from them and use them and shut them down. You've got to start demanding stuff and say, we're going to build our own businesses, buy from our own people, and, uh, and hold all, these, all your athletes and other entertainers accountable, too, to help you. All right, 800-450-7876. Speak to uh, Tahuti on line three from Alexandria. Tahuti? Uh, hello, uh, Carl. Thank you for taking my, my call. And uh, Dr. Anderson there, I'd like to say a hotel to you both uh, and to the, the listening audience. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, you know, I have always been a part of the struggle. My family are indigenous black Americans. My, uh, you know, we are uh, connected to the first people uh, in this part of the, the, the uh, uh, Western Hemisphere because my great grandma and grand and my granddad they were both uh, pure blood Navajo people. But I'm a black man, and I, you know, I got 14 brothers and sisters, and my mama's mama was a, a pure blood uh, Native American, a so-called Indian person. But we've been denied benefits because we will not go in the courts to try to prove that we are. But we've had businesses. We started our own businesses. We never had no problem uh, building wealth for ourselves until. I tell you what, tell who we come up on a break, and we go, when we come back, can you put it in a question form so he can respond? Because we got a lot of folks who want to speak to him. Eight hundred four five zero seventy eight seventy six. Real easy number to call. Speak to Dr. Claude Anderson. Take calls next. It's a big show. Rolls on from fourteen fifty. W-O-L, or Information 
is power. Thanks for joining with us, folks. Just want to remind you, uh, Brother Darren Muhammad will be here tomorrow. He's a researcher out of Baltimore. He's researching the latest in the Freddie Gray trial. In case you missed it, the first police officer who was accused of murdering Freddie Gray was found not guilty today. So Brother Darren's on the case. He'll report to us tomorrow. 800-450-7876. Speak to Dr. Anderson. Let's go back to Tahuti in Alexandria, Virginia. Tahuti, your question for Dr. Anderson. Yes, well, you know, I'm sorry for, for you know, giving you that brief, uh, history of my family and myself, but I just wanted to set up, the, but uh, set set the question up based on that, and that is the fact that we didn't have problems until the civil rights movement and all of the other corrupt politicians uh, in the black community start coming in and gangsterizing our businesses. But my question is, is that we know that the whole political system is corrupt, so. Wouldn't you advocate setting up our own political system? And then what is the true relationship between the black community and the so-called native community? Are they our friends? Okay, let let me ask those very quickly for you. First of all, uh, let, let me ask those very quickly because your time is running out. First of all, the Native Americans have never been your friends. Native Americans, the slavery never could have existed in America without the full, wholehearted participation and support of the so-called Native Americans. They're not really natives in the first place. They are, they are Asians that crossed the Bering Straits in about 500, 6,000 years ago and moved down the coast, the west coast, and, in, and interbred with the Folsom people, which are black people who come in from Africa and were living in Arizona, New Mexico, and, and California, and, and Nevada. And that's, how they, that's why they're not, that's why Indians don't look like Asians anymore. They got brown skin instead of yellow skin and round eyes instead of black uh, slant eyes. So, no, they've never been your friends. All the Indian tribes held slaves. They were slaveholders, slave traders, so they signed and fought with the South to maintain slavery. Indians have never, never been your, been your friend. And right now they're the ones that have been pushing to get you out of everything. The, Indians, the so-called white Indians sent a letter in, in, in 1939 to, uh, to, uh, to the United States Department of Interior and says, how do we shut black folk down so we can get around the 1866 Indian treaties, which means black Indians and black freemen should have been getting benefits just like Indians by law. The 1866 treaty is a law. And they said, how do we make sure blacks never get anything? And the United States Department of Interior answered them in about, eight, in about 1941 or 42, saying, what you do, you change the damn the platform. So instead of saying they're based on law, you start saying it's based on blood quant- on a quantum blood quantum law, which says say that black folk must be able to prove they got one quarter of Indian blood to get benefits, and therefore, then, and that's what the federal government told all the Indian tribes, and the Indian tribes have been doing it ever since. They've been getting benefits every year from this, from and all in all manners from the government for all for a hundred years and giving black folk nothing. You don't have any black leadership in this country that would have programs and, and meetings and focus on these issues. I'm telling you about the economic issues. They're going to go out and talk about gender issues and, about, and, and, and affordable housing and food stamps and welfare and sort of focus on these issues. You start demanding that black folks should be getting all the benefits from the 1866 Indian treaties and go on TV and radio and make an issue out of it. Now, the other question you asked me about was what was the last one? Pardon? The last what was the other question, question you asked me? Why should we just set up our own political system? Because this whole system is corrupt from the well, core. Well, let me, let me, I got it now. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the political system. You don't have to worry about the political system. If you get, if you get there, if you build your economy, like I told you, become self-sufficient, where you, can, where you can provide jobs and wealth and power for your own people, you can control the political system. You don't control the political system now because nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about what you think. And that's, and, and that's why the police don't respect you. Police can shoot three or four blacks every weekend. Who cares because black folk don't have, can't do anything except march? And see, the white system controls the politicians, and politicians are controlled by the businesses. The wealthy people, you've got about 400 billionaires in America. Those 400 billionaires and all these millionaires, they control the system. That's why down in Katrina, when you had the floods down there and, uh, and the tornadoes and the hurricanes, and those blacks sat out there for over two weeks with no food, no clothes, and no water. Nathan, what the, what the government did was send in the military. They didn't send, they didn't send down in to help to feed and clothe you. They sent, they sent the military down there to make sure you didn't break in and rob into the stores. Black folk got to get that through their heads and quit talking about thinking that somehow somebody's going to take care of them. Nobody's going to take care of you but black folk themselves. They better wake up and smell the coffee. All right. Yeah, thanks, that hoodie. 800-450-7876. Let's go to line five. Charles is waiting for us from the district. Charles, your question for Dr. Anderson. 
Uh, thanks for taking my call, uh, Brother Carl. Uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, I want to stay with this economic side of things. You mentioned group economics, but for those who may not understand or vision that, can you explain what it looks like and how does it create jobs? And then finally, in your five levels or foundations, I think there's one thing left out, and, and that's the enforcement. Who's going to ensure that if black businesses are patronized and supported, that they in turn go out and use black accountants, black legal people to keep that circulation going? So who are, who are the, I won't say policemen, but the enforcers to hold everyone accountable in the system? That, 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 that's a good question. Very good question. And, what that, and as I told you, in the meaning of a, of a community, you have to have a community. Once you build a community, there are three elements that I told you you must have in your community. You must have a wholly independent economic structure that can provide products, services, and goods, and jobs, and employment opportunities for your own people. The second thing you must have is a code of conduct. They tell you who you buy from, who you support, who you get, and you live with and buy from and, uh, and, and, and get security from and upliftment from. That's your own people. You've got to have a code of conduct. And in that code of conduct, you have to do what, what some of the other groups have done and we've never done. We have never, on the bad side, we have never had enough money to punish those people who sell you out. Because you never, and you can start by excommunicating them out of the race. When the Sambo sells you out and does bad things to you, you excommunicate them out. So you're not in our, in our community anymore, not our race, and run them out. Tell them you got to leave. We're not going to talk with you. We're not going to deal with you. We're not going to support you. You're out. And see, another one's got, got worse than that. What they got, the Indians and, and some, uh, some Indians and Puerto Ricans and, and, uh, and, and uh, Asians told me down in Puerto Rico for a national meeting once, they said they, uh, they have other groups, the Asians, first they had the Hatchman and the Tongue, which say you sell a black person, you sell a Chinaman out in Chinatown and kill him and rob and rape him and do things to him, you better get out of town before the sun goes down. Where is the black blacks? Maybe they should have had a mafia. Maybe they should have had an organized crime the unit. That's why the Italians can go in. They don't rob them. The Italians look out for their own communities. And see, what we have is nothing. We have no way of enforcing codes on anybody. People can do anything they want and go next door and break in and, and, and put drugs on their own children. We have no way of enforcing it. And see, other groups do. They would tell you in a second, we catch you in this community doing these kind of things. We're going we're gonna to run you out. And see, we need a, maybe, maybe some organized crime units that will function for the betterment and betterment of the community. Down in, down in, when the Cubans came into Miami and I was over education, the Cubans then took all that drug money was, they were rendering in Miami selling drugs. They put that money back into the community and put people into businesses and loaned and gave them the money and told them, you can, I'm a, you can have 51% of the business, I'm going to take 49%. And they started all things like everything from dealerships to warehouses and everything else. And see, black folk don't use their money. They can't even do wrong right. They don't use the money, even the wrong, the wrong money they get. They don't use it to try to help them people. They don't have a code of conduct. They'll let people get, get a black person with a gun. He'll go shoot his own damn people for no reason. We need a code of conduct, and the code of conduct comes out of having a very strong community that says these things will not be acceptable to us in this neighborhood and in this community. Get away from neighborhoods. A neighborhood is a, like a bucket with a hole in it. Build communities. Communities must have businesses that produces jobs, wealth, power, and opportunities, as well as a code of conduct and officials that you can hold accountable. 800-450-7876. take another call. Doc, you were on the cover of that African magazine. It's almost like Time magazine. What was that all about? Oh, that, that, that's because the African countries, uh, they've heard some of the saw A lot of my DVDs go all around the world, and we get a phenomenal amount of calls from everything from, through from England to France to, to Montreal to, through the Caribbean and through, all through the African countries, from Cameroon to Senegal. South Africa, Ghana, the Congo, and uh, even they wanted me to come and speak at the uh, African Unity Festival. And, uh, but what I said, I can't go because I don't have that kind of security. And, uh, and, I, and I, someone asked earlier in your program, why don't we have a convention? I tried earlier to see if I could get to raise some money to have a convention. We can bring all black folk together. And with all these, all these sharp, bright black folk I got all over this country with degrees, doctor's degrees and law degrees, I want to bring all the smart blacks together. To, to organize a national empowerment plan. The plan has already been drafted, and all of them had a role to play. And we can just, but I, I needed the money to be able to host a convention, either someplace like Washington, D.C., uh, Atlanta, Georgia, or Chicago. And I waited for almost seven months to get the money and didn't get one penny from any black that could effectuate enough money to be able to do it, to be able to hire a professional planning group that could do it. Because right now, and as, as you know, 
our friend Frances Wilson that, that passed, the last thing she told you called to give me as a message said, don't count on any black person got any major amount of money doing giving me any money to help black folk. They said they're, they're under control of whites. The whites are not going to let them do it, and they're going and their their interest is only in themselves. Am I right? Did she tell you that? She said, yeah, that's a system of white supremacy. That's why they can't give you any money. Well, see, that, that's why. So, so when you're listening, want to know why I couldn't pull a convention off? You just told me. That, like she said, tell Dr. Anderson, don't waste his time. There's not one black that's singing and dancing and playing with balls and telling jokes on TV that's going to give him any of those millions of dollars they got. And even though Harvest Institute is a tax-exempt nonprofit corporation, that they could, that they could write that, that contribution off against their taxes that blacks got money in this country, rather pay the taxes and give the money to an, to an organization that's fighting for them and for their people. And let me last thing I'm going to tell you again, they want to get my books and stuff, Carl, again, call the Powernomics Corporation, and that number is 301-564-6075. Again, 301-564-6075, or they can go to the website, www.powernomics.com, and order any of those materials. But right now, I don't, I'm not that optimistic about black folk anymore because those who got, uh, got resources don't give a damn about their own people, and those who are very concerned and do care about their people, they don't have the money. And I wish I had the power. I could pick up all these smart blacks I got around the country, a lot of them holding meetings and doing everything else. If I had, if I had the power and wealth, I would bring them all together, and we would plan, and we would exercise these plans to be a very powerful group of people. If black folk voted as a block, and practice group economics, they could be the most powerful people in this country within a very short period of time. All right, let's see if we can take another call real quick. 800-450-7876. Jonathan's reaching out to us from L.A. He's on line four. Jonathan, you have a question for Dr. Anderson? Hello? John yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. we got two minutes. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay. I'm going to make it really fast. Um, once again, Dr. Anderson, can you explain about why the Indians are not, those people who are identified as Indians now are not indigenous and Indians and where they came from. And also, can you um, answer the question, as black people, what is our political status here in this country? And I'll take both answers off the air. Thank you. Okay, very quickly, about 90, 92, about approximately 90, 92 percent of all the people in America that call themselves the Indians now are not Indians. Most of them are whites passing as Indians. And then, and, and in history, history books back in the 1800s, uh, late 1890s called them five dollar Indians because when the, when the government established the, uh, the Dawes Commission saying go around and, and, and identify all the blacks in America that had, had been, that were freedmen or black Indians or freed blacks, period, and put them on the Dawes roll and give them a number so they'd be entitled to benefits just like American Indians. And when, they, when the whites heard about that, they went down to the Dawes Commission and gave them five dollars and put their names on their list. As Indians, because they say we got straight hair, and Indians got straight hair, we put our names on them. So ninety, about ninety, ninety-two percent of all the people call themselves the Indians in America now are not Indians. Those are whites passing as Indians, and that's why blacks don't get any benefits because Indians have sided with them. And the in cahoots, they want to make sure that black folk never get any benefits. We have a lawsuit called it, uh, the Freedmen Lawsuit Federation lawsuit right now. We've been in the, in the small claim court in Washington D.C. We're in the Sixth Circuit Court and the Appeals Court. Doc, we're just about out of time. We, we're done. <laughs> we got like 10 seconds. No, no, that's, I understand, Carl. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Doc. Folks, we're out of here. We're running late. Stay strong. Stay positive. Stay in the light. We'll see you tomorrow.